Future Hindsight is brought to you with the support of The Jordan Harbinger Show and its dynamic host, Jordan Harbinger. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The famed Socratic method, where you test ideas with questions and see how they fare and let go of them if they don't withstand scrutiny is actually one of the most beautiful and powerful mind inoculants ever invented. We can enhance it and turn it into something that goes even further in the direction of inoculating minds against the worst forms of cognitive contagion. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a civic engagement podcast. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Our guest is Andy Norman, the author of Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and The Search for a Better Way to Think. He offers tools to inoculate our minds against the worst forms of ideological contagion. And since we've learned so much about our body's immune system during the pandemic, it'll be easy to understand the concept of mental immunity. We start our conversation with how it works. Mental immunity is the mind's resistance to bad ideas. We know that our bodies have immune systems, and these immune systems protect us from dangerous microbes, and especially infectious microbes. But where bodily immune systems protect us against physical microbes, mental immune systems protect us against dangerous or infectious ideas. A psychologist named William McGuire began studying how you can create resistance to new information in a mind. And he found that if you expose a mind to a weakened form of an argument, then the mind will develop resistance to even stronger versions of the same argument. And he immediately saw the analogy with inoculation. So he called his theory inoculation theory and he essentially showed that minds behave as if they have immune systems. We are now in a position where leading scientists are not saying minds behave as if they have immune systems, but some of the more forward-thinking ones are actually beginning to say minds do have immune systems, and here's how they function, and here's how we can make them function better. I love it. I think one of my favorite quotes in your book is that the art of bad idea removal is on the verge of becoming a science. Then I thought, yes, this is it. We need to inoculate our minds against bad ideas. You say that bad ideas are mind parasites. Tell us why bad ideas are the equivalent of a mind parasite. You've asked the two fundamental and essential questions here. Think about the properties of bad ideas that manage to spread despite being bad. Number one, they require a host. Number two, they can take up residence in our minds. Once they take up residence in a mind, they can begin to create copies of themselves. And just as, uh, say, the influenza virus can induce an infection, an infectious idea can induce a mind to spread it to other minds. When information epidemiologists study the way misinformation spreads across the internet, they see quite clearly that the principles of epidemiology apply to the way information and particularly misinformation spreads. So we are now talking quite unapologetically about memes as having a life of their own, something that we can all witness every day by opening up social media. So if you begin to take this analogy seriously, you start to see all kinds of ways in which our minds are actually being hacked by ideas that essentially serve their own interests at our expense, and even more worrisome by demagogic actors in the political space that are actually hacking mental immune systems to further their political ambitions. Can you give us an example of something that we can objectively agree is a bad idea? Yeah, say sticking your hand into a hot fire is a bad idea. Dropping a bowling ball on your foot is a bad idea. Um, Let's say among my liberal friends, the idea of outlawing gay marriage is universally considered 
a straightforward example of a bad idea. Now, if you focus only on the controversial, difficult cases, you can begin to develop a suspicion that there's no such thing as an objectively bad idea. But if you actually return to ordinary, everyday, uncontroversial cases, you start to see that ideas have properties that can make them objectively problematic. So, for example, falsehood is universally recognized as a bad property in an idea. If an idea, say, incites violence, that's another kind of bad property. Ideas can be dispiriting, they can be inspiring, they can be confusing. And all of these properties of ideas contribute to the idea's goodness or badness. And when philosophers examine ideas, they actually try to get past the subjective valuation and ask themselves, what properties does this idea really have so that I can assess it in some kind of fair-minded way? And when you do that, you begin to see that there are objective modes of idea assessment that we very much need in our day and age. So then I think my next question goes kind of nicely right after this explanation. How do you define ideology and why is ideology not neutral? Yeah, so it turns out that the concept of ideology is used in two quite different ways. Sometimes people use it to mean a problematic nexus of ideas. And sometimes people just use it to mean a nexus of ideas, whether or not it's problematic. We have plenty of useful neutral descriptors of belief systems, just belief system or worldview, for example. So we don't need yet another synonym for worldview or belief system. So let's take the concept of ideology and actually use it to designate systems of ideas or beliefs that are objectively problematic because of the way they impact human well-being. So it seems to me that we are deep in the soup of this cultural immune system disorder right now. I mean, even though the Trump era is maybe over, I'm not sure. But in any case, we are swimming in different ideologies, left, right, and center, and we can't get out. Wherever you turn, we are confronted with yet another person with another ideology. So you talk about the reasons fulcrum and how it boosts our mental immunity. So what is a reasons fulcrum and how do we use it? You've put your finger on what I consider the linchpin of the mind's immune system and the key to restoring civility and public discourse. There's a norm that holds sway in reason-giving dialogue or in scientific discourse. And the norm basically is this. If you have one point of view and I have another, then the person with the better reasons wins. And it's up to the other person, the person with the weaker reasons, to change their mind. So I call this reasons fulcrum because where this norm is operative, reasons can actually do what they're supposed to do, which is change minds. But where that norm becomes damaged by, say, demagogic political actors or by a former president who just wantonly abuses that norm, when that happens, people start to lose their sense that talk, speech, sh should be accountable. The norm loses its sway over us and thinking becomes more and more unhinged. And that's what we're seeing in our time. So you came up with a mind vaccine. How does it work? Well, so this inoculation theory suggests that you can inoculate minds against bad ideas. Now, in, in immunology, an inoculant is kind of a simple attempt to increase resistance to a microbe. But if you take an inoculant and you enhance it in various ways, you can actually turn it into a vaccine, something that gives a more or less complete immunity. I argue that the famed Socratic method, where you test ideas with questions and see how they fare and let go of them if they don't withstand scrutiny, that that method is actually one of the most beautiful and powerful mind inoculants ever invented. We can enhance it and turn it into something that goes even further in the direction 
of inoculating minds against the worst forms of cognitive contagion. So when QAnon spreads in a viral way, like wildfire across the internet, it's pretty clear that mental immune systems have been badly compromised. But we can rebuild mental immune strength through a combination of what I call mental immune boosters, mind vaccines, mind inoculants, and basically a, a kind of education that primes mental immune systems to test ideas before they buy into them and become attached to them. Let's try the new Socratic method. How is it different than the Socratic method as we know it? Right. So Socrates was this guy, he lived in ancient Greece. He would wander the streets of Athens and strike up conversations with his fellow Athenians, and he would use questions, initial, mostly clarifying questions, to get people to reflect more critically on the views they held. Now, this didn't make him very popular, and his fellow Athenians eventually convicted him of corrupting the youth and worshiping false gods and sentenced him to death. Now, one of the reasons Socrates was sent to death is that he could be a bit of a jerk. He would use his questioning method to make people look foolish, and this earned him enemies. So it turns out that if you just try to use questions and, and objections to defeat people in argument, you get pushback. In fact, people dig their heels in and become more resistant to persuasion. But there's a kinder, gentler version of the Socratic method that can actually win over people who are already very attached to problematic ideas. And this involves the use of clarifying questions, but the careful avoidance of gotcha questions or uh, points that make people look foolish. And so what I call the new Socratic method does involve using two kinds of questions, both clarifying ones and then gentle objections or challenges to get people to see the drawbacks of the ideas they have grown attached to. So I know that you tried this in the classroom through collaborative inquiry. What's a good example of how you did this in the classroom, just to bring this alive to the listeners? Well, thanks for asking. I spent about 25 years discussing difficult issues with my students in philosophy classrooms. And basically, we'd try to talk in open, honest, mutually respectful ways about right and wrong, and the origins of good and evil, and how you know things, and how do you tell the difference between knowledge and mere opinion. These are the questions philosophers love to address, and philosophers are deeply committed to trying to answer those questions in a fair-minded way. But let me give you a couple of more striking examples of the use of something like the new Socratic method. Daryl Davis is a black blues musician who encountered a member of the Ku Klux Klan in a blues bar, struck up a friendship, and over a period of months deconverted that Klansman, got him to give up his racist views. And he did this primarily by listening to the guy trying to understand his views, asking clarifying questions that didn't threaten the relationship, but encouraged this KKK member to begin examining his own views more deeply. He ended up stepping down, renouncing his racist views, and giving Daryl Davis his former Klansman robes. And dozens, if not hundreds, of other Klansmen have followed suit, in part because Daryl Davis went on a mission to actually just talk to them and listen to them. Dialogue can actually heal damaged mental immune systems. Another example, I've got a friend named Lee McIntyre, who's a wonderful philosopher of science, who went undercover at a flat earth convention and tested some techniques to deconvert flat earthers. And he found them enormously difficult to deconvert. But in a book he has coming out called How to Talk to a Science Denier, he applies some of the things he learns both by studying the research and through trial and error to actually convince some anti-vaxxers that he knows to reconsider or to at least soften their views about vaccines. So those are my two shining success stories about the power of dialogue to heal and change minds. 
Those are great examples. Also, as an aside, we had Lee McIntyre on for our season on Post Truth, oh. which was also terrific. Fantastic. We really enjoyed him. But what is a good clarifying question? And what's a good challenge? What's a good question to ask if you're like, well, is that really true? And get to a different place. So the basic form of a clarifying question is just, you know, what do you mean by that? Or can you help me understand that better? And the idea here is just to get the person who's making a controversial or problematic claim to just open up about what they think, what they believe, and to spell out its implications. So here are the kind of questions that can work in these situations. On a scale of zero to 100, how confident would you say that QAnon is real? On a scale of zero to 100, how confident are you that climate change is a hoax? And then you can begin to ask questions like, tell me a bit about your sources on this. Do you feel like you know this to be true, that climate change is a hoax? And if so, can you show me that it's true? And when somebody struggles to actually articulate their own reasons for their beliefs, they often, sometimes a week or two later, come to the realization, maybe I don't know that after all. By the way, a wonderful question to ask in conversations like these, if you run into somebody who proves to be stubbornly resistant, is just to say, what would change your mind? Tell me what sorts of circumstances would actually result in your letting go of this belief. So combative conversation doesn't work, but open, honest, compassionate dialogue does. The evidence is now building that it can, but it's hard to scale and it takes patience. We'll continue our conversation with Andy in a moment, but I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about our sponsor, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Like us, The Jordan Harbinger Show focuses on the fascinating people shaping our world, uncovering their lives and motivations. Jordan's show was named one of the best of 2018, and it's easy to see why. His show and his interviews are carefully crafted to give you a clearer understanding of the world today, letting you make the right decisions for a better life. I would even say that Jordan's show will help strengthen your mental immunity, exposing you to new ideas, making you question long-held norms, and thinking critically about the world before you. I really enjoy the show and think you will as well. There's just so much here. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I definitely think that we can change people's minds, but I think in some instances it may be too late. I mean, one of the things that I was asking myself was, who's going to read this book? You know, except for people like me who already believe in the premise that we can do something like this. Probably the people who believe in QAnon are not going to pick up this book. And they will probably also not be persuaded. And so wh what do you think about that? Like, who is your ideal audience? Yeah. So people like you are my ideal audience. And I think, Mila, people like you are inclined to accept that mind infections can be real. And of course, people who are in the grips of an infectious ideology, say, are going to be the hardest people to convince. It's very important that we reach them, certainly for the purposes of civic harmony. But we're not going to get there overnight. The way to do this is to raise awareness of the principles of cognitive immunology and their power to free minds. First and foremost, among people close to us, people who think like us, our friends, our family, people who are open to new ideas. And as the ideas begin to take root in the subcultures, the subculture of science, the subculture of philosophy, the subculture of people who care about honest inquiry, and then you hope <laughs> that these ways of strengthening mental immune systems will spread outward by osmosis through our culture. So the audience of my book is us, people who love science, people who love to think, people who love ideas. The book is meant to equip you 
with ways to strengthen the mental immune systems in your orbit, not just your own, but those of your family and your friends. So then what are two things that I could be doing to mainstream your mind vaccine? Or, you know, at least in my immediate orbit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the first thing you can do is, is not shy away from controversial questions. My grandmother once told me, never discuss politics or religion in polite company. Now, that's a nice way to avoid conflict at the dinner table. But when you avoid the hard questions, you essentially end up compromising our species future because we can't just keep kicking the hard questions and just ignore them and expect them to answer themselves. So when you ask questions like, what is a bad idea? What is a good idea? And how do we tell the difference? When you ask hard questions like that, you actually begin to strengthen our mind's immune systems. You begin to enhance our ability to distinguish good from bad, right from wrong. The number one thing I would encourage people to do is not avoid essentially philosophical questions. Lean in, take them on, ask them. If you prioritize clarifying questions and withstand the urge to engage in dialectical combat, when you reason to win an argument and begin to treat reasons as weapons, you end up compromising that conversation's capacity to enlighten, and you also end up compromising your own mental immune system. But if instead you reason to find out and reason collaboratively, engage in honest dialogue that can actually reach and change your own mind, when we do that, mental immune systems get stronger. My advice here would be to seek out the difficult, interesting, philosophically rich conversations Find a friend, test ideas, use questions, and shed the ideas that don't withstand scrutiny. This is good advice and fertile ground for rich conversations and also changing minds. One of the things that you said in the book, which I think slots in nicely here, is that values are not subjective because I think here's where we shy away from those conversations, right? To your grandmother's point, like we don't want to get into fight with people and it's commonly believed that everyone is entitled to their opinion and or their belief. And in fact, you say that this is the centerpiece of a morally corrupt ethos. And I was like, wow, those are fighting words. So let's go there. Why are values not subjective? Good. Well, let me combine that with the idea that everyone is entitled to their opinion. Those two views, that, that you're entitled to your opinions, number one, and that values are merely subjective, number two, those two ideas are actually mental immune disruptors. When you absorb those ideas uncritically, you begin to treat the kind of inquiry that could actually change your mind about value. The whole exercise starts to look pointless because if nothing is really right or really wrong, why bother? Why try to deepen your understanding of right and wrong if it's all just subjective? So I'm, I'm not claiming that all values are objective because you know whether you like the red tie or the blue tie is a question that comes down to taste. But there are many moral questions that are clearly not subjective. For example, kindness is objectively more conducive to collective well-being than cruelty is. There's a reason we almost universally regard cruelty as bad, and that's because cruelty is an objectively unreliable way to promote human flourishing. Whereas kindness, on the other hand, is an objectively reliable way. So this idea that everyone is entitled to their beliefs makes people complacent and unwilling to change their minds. It's a mental immune disruptor. Our cognitive lives are regulated both by rights and responsibilities. And the ethos we live in right now is one that has emphasized our cognitive rights, our right to believe, our right to our opinion, to the exclusion of our responsibilities. And the fact is, it matters when we believe in unaccountable ways. If you indulge in, say, a um, poorly evidenced belief that your race is superior to other races, you might derive some cheap sense of superiority, and maybe that will solve your ego. But you're essentially doing it at the expense of others around you. And when you 
indulge in beliefs that benefit you at the expense of others, that's fundamentally selfish. So we can't do that without sacrificing our claim to be part of the solution. We need to get past the idea that we're entitled to our beliefs, just as we need to get past the idea that all values are subjective. In societies all around the world, basic human virtues like honesty and fairness and kindness are affirmed just across the board. Now, there are sociopaths out there who disagree, but I don't feel any need to take their opinion into consideration. And my inability to persuade a Donald Trump that lying and manipulation is wrong is not going to prevent me from pushing for moral progress. There are moral deviants and sociopaths out there that will lie, cheat, and steal to their personal advantage. But whether we can persuade them is not the relevant test of whether honesty, fairness, and kindness are truly virtues. Well, to go back to your reasons, Fulcrum, it's up to them to change their minds, right? Like it's not your responsibility to change their minds because otherwise I think you're going to fall into that same trap of being dogmatic about your own beliefs or your own values. Yeah, so there's a peculiar kind of discourse called religious apologetics where someone who believes fervently in a particular religious dogma is trained in how to defeat non-believers in argumentation. And so religious apologists will often set up debates with non-believers like myself, and they'll go through the exercise of exchanging reasons. But what's curious about that is if I enter a conversation wanting to convince you, but being completely unwilling to be persuaded by you, that's not truly a dialogue. It's basically an attempt to manipulate minds. So real dialogue requires that both parties be willing to submit to the better reason and be willing to change their minds, to be persuadable. And what we've seen in our country over the last 30 or 40 years is a steady stream of people who essentially treat conversation as a battle. This is the origin of America's culture war, and it's tearing the civic fabric apart. If you engage in conversation to win while I'm trying to have a conversation to actually learn the truth, you might gain power, but you're going to do it at the long-term expense of our collective well-being. I like that. I think that's very well put. So you argue that we need a responsible, shared understanding of what matters, which is the anti-culture war in a way. So one of the things that you talk about a lot is education and how it's like a bucket theory. And I wanted to ask you about how you would teach our youngest citizens of the world to engage in this kind of new Socratic method and, you know, learn it for a lifetime? Wow. Wonderful question. There's a movement among some philosophers to teach philosophy to children. And the basic idea is the kids are enormously curious about life's big questions. And if you give them a chance to explore those questions in conversation, their minds can just come alive. So let me give a, a small example. So a teacher gathers the kindergartners or the first graders on the story rug. And she says, you know what? Imagine if little Johnny did something that hurt little Susie's feelings, but he was following the rules. Did Johnny do something wrong or not? And some kids say yes, some kids say no. And then they start to talk about it. And then you could say, all right, well, here's an example of little Susie doing something that broke the rules and it ended up helping Johnny. Did Susie do the right thing? So you can get kids to engage with the question, are these rules good ones? Are these rules really helping us or hurting us? You can get them interested in those questions at a very young age and getting them to actually think out of the box about right and wrong. And it's a beautiful thing just to watch their mind light up with the sense of possibility about how many interesting questions there are to explore out there. That's terrific. So I have just one more question. Mm -hmm. 
Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? So the science of immunology completely transformed our relationship to the little microscopic beasties that thrive at our expense and led to treatments that have saved literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of lives. And the amount of human suffering that the science of immunology has allowed us to escape is truly phenomenal. I think that this new science of cognitive immunology is going to have comparably revolutionary effects because it'll transform our relationship to the little microscopic beasties that too often infect human minds. Just as we gained a degree of autonomy from smallpox by developing the smallpox vaccine, we can develop autonomy from QAnon and science denial and conspiracy thinking by developing our mind's immune systems. And I think if we do this at scale over the next 10 or 20 years, we could do a great deal to pull our planet back from the brink of climate catastrophe and other forms of catastrophe that uh, I don't need to get into, but uh, it's going to require the application of cognitive immunology. Well, I hope that cognitive immunology will soon take over the planet, like you said, 10 or 12 years, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, in, comparatively speaking very soon. You know, you spoke about 18 centuries of the Hellenic period, and I thought, well, maybe we'll have another 18 centuries of the new Socratic method taking hey, hold. Hey, from your, from your lips to the God's ears, <laughs> Mila, I love the suggestion. <laughs> Thank I you. I hope it works out there. <laughs> Thank <way>. you. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight and congratulations on your really brilliant book. Thank you so much, Mila. It's been a real pleasure. There's so much here that I love and is thought-provoking about the future of humanity and about what it means to be an accountable citizen. The advice to engage in the big questions of what's right and wrong and to be in dialogue with others who might disagree with us seems like a tall order. There's no question that I personally prefer to talk about the weather in order to avoid having a confrontational conversation about beliefs. However... Asking clarifying questions and listening are a small price to pay to overcome mental immune disruptors. I'll endeavor to find the courage to talk about the big ideas with whoever is in my immediate orbit, and I hope that you will too. Next week, our guest is Colin Jerelmack, the author of Up to Heaven and Down to Hell, Fracking, Freedom and Community in an American Town. We discuss how a Pennsylvania community navigates and justifies the externalities of people's private decisions and what the consequences are for our democracy. The idea of the public-private paradox is that a lot of decisions and actions that are treated as private are actually public. For instance, driving an SUV versus driving an electric vehicle or versus not driving a vehicle at all, these are treated as private decisions which are not regulated, but in the aggregate, if every one of us chooses these decisions that are more carbon intensive, we impinge on the public sphere in the form of greenhouse gases, global warming. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.